There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all. I'm your host, Chance Garten, and you found your way to the Innerverse podcast. This recording is coming to you from April 24th, 2020, during some of the weirdest and possibly most important times any of us have ever lived through. I'm glad you're joining us today because we are each individually approaching some very significant milestones in our personal heroes and sheroes journeys. And now more than ever, we need to be seeking and sharing the truth with everything we do. What that looks like for each of us might be different on the surface, but whether you're a painter, a healer, or simply a human who wants to protect and cherish life in any way that you can, the quest to destroy the metaphorical ring of power and overthrow the forces of darkness just doesn't seem all that straightforward these days. Without a literal dragon to slay or an invading army at our doorstep, all the ideas that we've been fed about what makes a hero can be difficult to apply to our day-to-day lives. Luckily, we live in a time where there are mythological masterpieces available to us that transcend the Hollywood hex of anti-heroes and dark protagonists, and one of those stories is The Lord of the Rings. If there's one lesson to learn from the lethargic hobbits who became legendary cultural icons, it's that the real battle with evil is our own inner struggle to do the small good things that we can do in the face of overwhelming opposition. To take one step at a time and trust that the winds of the universe are at our backs when we decide to fulfill our destinies as ring bearers. And since we all have a shadow, that means we each carry the ultimate weapon of evil within us, which is our free will capacity to seek power over others because of the fear of our own weakness which is the prime reason that our world has been plagued by cults, power-hungry governments, and egomaniacal sorcerer priests since the beginning of recorded history and beyond. All of these ideas are going to need to be explored and healthily integrated by humanity if we want to leave the wintertime withering of our collective consciousness and return to springtime in the Shire. And we've got a great guest this time around to help us light the path. I'm really excited to have David Whitehead return to Interverse for another round because he's definitely been a huge personal role model for me over the last couple of years since I discovered his work. David is an extremely prolific content creator and researcher into esoteric ideas, a teacher of martial arts, philosopher, and way shower on our eternal road to self-actualization. And he's here today to help us understand the true nature of heroism and the connection between creativity, imagination, and the great war of our time for moral victory over total enslavement. You can find his mountain of work at Way of the Truth Warrior on YouTube, where he's got some extremely awesome recent video playlists on his research into cults, a new series starting an examination of the Lord of the Rings as the guiding myth of our times, and several rational discussions about the insanity of this COVID-19 shitstorm, just to describe a little fraction of his recent stuff. He's also on Patreon at Way of the Truth Warrior, and as a patron of David's for the past two years, I can say there's a lot of bang for your buck if you support him. And lately, I've particularly benefited from the awesome Training at Home series that David has been publishing on Patreon to help us deal with the gym closures and inactivity that being stuck at the house can bring about. David is also a martial arts teacher and the co-host of an unbelievably deep and powerful podcast called Unslaved, where he and legendary occult author and researcher Michael Tessarion discuss some of the most powerful and important thinkers and ideas that are largely marginalized or ignored by mainstream culture. I've been a member of Unslaved for years now, and it's been one of the most positive and productive influences on my thinking and character that I've ever found. So make sure you check out unslaved.com as soon as you can. I'll post all the links to Dave in the show notes. And while you're there, you can also hit the link to Interverse Plus on Patreon, where you can get the second hour of this show and unlock the huge archive of extended episodes by supporting me month to month. And thanks, everybody who is doing that. We've had a nice surge in members lately, and I really appreciate it. If you like this episode, you might also want to go back to David's first appearance on Interverse back in October of 2018, where we talked about the enlightening elements of martial arts, what it means to be a spiritual warrior, how we can know that we have free will, the pillars of self-esteem, and how the true meaning of shadow work is in working with our bodies to heal tension and trauma that is in the psyche. And with all that said, I am super psyched to be speaking with Dave once again. So everybody, please join me in welcoming him back to the show by dropping him a nice comment on social or sharing some of his content that you enjoy. Now it's time to take some big steps on our heroic journey with Sensei Dave, the ultimate unslaver of the universal unconscious and ferocious fighter for humanity's free will. 
Thanks for being here, man. And welcome back to Interverse. Wow. Hey, Chance. So good to be with you again. And man, you have the best introductions. You put me to shame, man. I, I love it. And I'm uh, very grateful for that and your kind words. Um, your show has just been exploding as well. And I, I'm also a supporter of yours on Patreon. I love your content. You do a really good job and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, with your stuff on Unslaved, it really needs no introduction. I have to, I feel like it's a good idea to be as catchy and interesting as possible in my intros to try and get some new minds to look at these ideas that are so marginalized. But the beautiful thing about Unslaved is it's a members only thing. <laughs> you don't take any crap. You just, and you just go straight for the, the jugular with some of the most intense and, and incredible exposés of the, the dark side of human history, if you will, but also the, the real tried and true ancient solutions for how we can bring balance to our consciousness and heal the world from the inside out. So I got to give you the round of applause, man. That stuff has been extremely beneficial to my life. Before we get going, do you have any opening thoughts about any of the tons of different things I brought up in the intro there? Well, you brought up everything. Uh, I, we could, if we'll, we'll spend the rest of this show, I guess, going through it bit by bit, and uh, we can talk about whatever you're in the mood for. But I would say that I, I think that what I can say that I personally feel right now, I sort of feel it in the air, that this is a time of great awakening. And um, it's not for the faint of heart what I think is about to ensue on this planet. And I think that, uh, but at the same time, it's necessary what we're going through as hard as it is during this lockdown, the, all the infighting that's going on uh, where everybody's trying to figure out what's what, and should we listen to the mainstream media? Should we listen to the world health organization? Should we listen to all these alternative podcasters? Should we, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to see all these subjects come out to the forefront of the big uh, discussion in the mainstream right now. When you look at social media, all we're seeing is the numbers of the mainstream media and the Snopes.coms of the world and the wicked, they're, they're dropping and people are switching over to coming to shows like yours, to shows like mine and so many others to go back and look at these great subjects in a different way. Uh, because what else are you going to do? We're all in lockdown. We're all wondering what's happening. We're all trying to figure out what's the, what are the elites of the world? What are they, where are they steering us right now? And so for me, this is an amazing opportunity to produce content. This is our time to shine, Chance, you and me and people like us who've been sort of in the shadows, in the background, in the shadow banning world of social media. And now people are hungrier than ever to get some other perspectives on the information that they're being exposed to and as they reflect on the situation that we're currently in. So it's an honor for me personally to be able to do this work with my podcast, Way of the Truth Warrior, uh, to do this incredible project, this life-changing project with, uh, with Michael on the Unslaved podcast. And just a little bit about that. I mean, the, one of the reasons we actually put that as a paid content system was because we originally started out doing a very, you know, very traditional model of having the first hour go out free and then having the second hour behind the paywall on our site to help support our work. But then we continually ran into censorship issues, even on very benign subjects, subjects that aren't super controversial. We just kept getting hit all the time. And then, uh, so we said, you know what, we're going to run our own ship. We're going to do it our own way. And in order to do that, anybody that has tried to get off the, the social media platforms and do their own work will know that it's incredibly costly now as, uh, as companies are charging incredible amounts just for bandwidth usage, et cetera. So we now have, uh, we've set it up with our members, with our supporters that they support us. They finance this operation. We do the work and the research it's a win-win. It's a low cost. And I think it's worth it. And people right now are in droves supporting alternative media like you and me more than ever before. So I'm always grateful for that. But at the same time, I still believe in putting out a lot of free content for people because we need to have this discussion in the mainstream as well. So I do that on my way to the Truth Warrior podcast and through the other projects that I'm with doing shows like this, et cetera. So it's a, it's a big unified effort right now to cast the ring into the fire. And that, of course, is the la latest project that I'm breaking down with a recent discovery that I've made with this fantastic woman. Her name is Laura Lee Scaife. And her and I came together rather serendipitously. And I'll tell that story in a little bit. 
but uh, essentially we're doing a four-part series on the Lord of the Rings as the guiding myth of our time. It's not just a children's story. It wasn't just a movie. There's a whole deeper meaning and a deeper history that is encoded into that story that I think the time has come to tell it in this depth. So uh, we just did the first episode. It's getting incredible feedback and I can't wait to do the second episode. We're going to be doing it live this coming Tuesday. And you can follow me on my social media for updates about that. I do recommend people get into that. I listened to it today and Laura Lee, I would say she's got to be an elf from the blessed realm or something like Galadriel <laughs> herself. Her wisdom runs deep. It's ancient, ancient uh, gnosis, really. Super fun to listen to that. And synchronistic too, because you know, you and Michael bring up Tolkien and Lord of the Rings pretty often, but there had yet to be any content that was like an entire episode dedicated just to that. And I was getting hungry for it. So I went and rounded up Becca Tarnas, who is a Tolkien scholar, daughter of Richard Tarnas, who you guys actually brought up one of his Jungian books in the, uh, one of his astrology books, actually, in that, in that first episode of your Lord of the Rings series. So I'm going to be bringing Becca back soon. She is a wealth of knowledge as well. You guys might want to look at having her on Unslaved yourselves to talk about, uh, to have a fully fledged LOTR episode, because as you are pointing out in this new series, it is the defining myth of our time. And I was hoping you could give us a little more context into what exactly you mean by that. Wow, that's great, Chad. Grid's fine. Um, and yeah, please share that contact. I would love to do that. And actually, it's, uh, it's amazing that you're having her on your show. And um, I'd be more than happy to link that episode when you get it done into the series, just to let people know there's so many other good uh, element of people working on this idea. I think that's so important. And how it came together for me was for me personally, Lord of the Rings was always a very, very special story. I grew up with it as many probably did. I grew up reading the Chronicles of Narnia, Ivanhoe, Percival, you know, you read all this stuff and, and it, you know, it's, it's got so much of this mythical element to it. It's almost like you're reading a dream. And that's what's interesting about it is that it educates you on a different level than just this logical left brain compartmentalized thinking that we're so used to. Um, and not to dismiss that logical side of your mind. We need that. That's connected to the logos. That's the science, the scientist in you that wants to get out there and, and try to understand the, the objective reality. But there's also a subjective reality that we all uh, have to understand as we experience that objective reality we as unique individuals are constantly interfacing with that. And so we're multidimensional as your, your show, Interverse Podcast. That's what you're all about, Chance. And I love that there's people out there like you doing it. And so I'm like, okay, I have to do something on this in a unique way. You're right. Michael has talked about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings for quite some time as well. And part of what he was sharing with me was what inspired me to do this series. And we are going to be doing more of that on Unslaved in the future. But I wanted to take a crack at it on my own on Truth Warrior. And I, I found Laura Lee. It, it, it's just a weird timing. So it, it's been a pretty chaotic period for me since this whole lockdown started. I, I literally just bought a home. We just moved. My family, we just moved to this new home. I just closed the deal like a few days before they hit the lockdown. And I'm an entrepreneur. And at the same time that they did the closure, I lost half of my business because I had basically there was big padlocks put on the gym. I couldn't teach martial arts anymore. So I'm like, oh my God, like, like so many people out there right now, I'm sure who are suffering from this chaos. I start thinking, okay, I've got to figure out a solution. Thank goodness I had already been doing all of this other work and I've, you know, I've, I've set myself up in other ways. I, you know, but I'm still, you know, I was going through that. And then sadly, my mother just recently passed away. So that was a shocker. It just sort of happened out of the blue. Um, and no, she didn't die from COVID. It was something completely different. And so I was going through that. And I, I and then of course, you know, just the tension and anxiety and, and, and just the excitement of the whole, the whole thing happening in the world right now, which is unprecedented. It just all started really eating at me. And I, I needed to find a place to strengthen myself. So I would go outside and you know, go, go to the beach close to me here, the one that wasn't closed, and try to draw some strength from nature. But I needed something else. And so I, start, I just naturally said, you know what? I haven't seen Lord of the Rings in a while. Let's just go watch it start to back. So I sat down with my mother-in-law three nights in a row. 
we pulled out the popcorn and we watched all three of them. And I, it just, it, it brought me back to just more meaning. There was something about that story again, that just hit me and it gave me that strength that I was needing. And I was feeling the, I was feeling the high from it. And then I get an email in my inbox from this lady named Laura Lee. And I'm like, Oh, I, who's this person? And she had mentioned that she was friends with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Chris Rusak, who was somebody I partnered with years ago when we did the modern knowledge tour, which where we were traveling across Canada, doing all of these live events for people. And so anyway, she said, I, I used to work, or I, I know Chris really well. And I love your show. I love, Uns I'm a member of Unslaved. I've been following your Truth Warrior blogs forever. And I, I you had mentioned Lord of the Rings. And I don't know if you know, but I've actually produced an entire series on it. I'm writing a book on it. Um, here's my work. She's, she's into the, she's done lots of historical work, psychological work. Like she's, she just comes from such a diverse background and she wasn't trying to pitch herself. She was just trying to say, Hey, I want to share this work with you. You might like it. I started reading like the first five seconds of her website and then going through some of her videos. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know why this just feels so right you have to come on my show and we have to just do an introductory episode. And I was originally just thinking, let's just bring her on, have a live stream, talk about Lord of the Rings. And then as I got deeper into it and I started thinking it, I woke up at like three in the morning one night and I, I just had this feeling in me that I couldn't shake. And I'm like, no, this has to be done right. There's something very important about this. And it's because I had been covering a lot of the technical information about the virus and what's going on in the world and all the conspiratorial aspects and all that stuff. And I figured, okay, I can't just throw just that out at people. That's, it's just too much. There, there has to be a, something that's empowering. There's got to be some solutions. There's got to be some right brain aspects here to activate. And I, as I thought about it, I spoke, I called Laura Lee right away and I said, hey, we got to do something serious. And so she said, okay, I've got about 400 slides that I could give you and we could go through. And I'm like, wow, 400, that's going to take forever. So I said, let's break it up into bits. And uh, we decided to do four parts. And uh, I made a nice little trailer for the, sh for the series. And the first episode went off uh, really, really well. And I'm looking forward to the second one, but a little context of it. And this is from Laura Lee's website. So this just kind of gives you the synopsis. She wrote it beautifully. She says, you know, Lord of the Rings is the myth for our time. And not because it's a new story, but because it draws from a great body of ancient knowledge that has been obfuscated through distortion and deception. By studying the characters and meaning of this complex tale, we rediscover the wisdom of our ancestors, the men of the West thereby regenerating the courage, dignity, and sense of purpose required to meet the time, to meet the demands of our time in history. And she just has this, as you've, if you've heard of the show, you, she just has this very old soul kind of type of voice to her. Like, and I mean that in the most respectful way, she's got this very deep wisdom to her. And I've had a, a bunch of conversations offline with her and I was blown away by her knowledge. I felt like in a way she, she reminds me of Michael in a way with, with that eclecticism and that, that strength and just that, uh, that ability to decode this in an esoteric way. And I was like, all right, this is going to be amazing. And I've been proven right. The show is one of the most popular shows I've done. It, people are, you know, basically writing me huge thank yous and they're in tears and like, I, this is what I've been waiting for. And honestly, Chance, I think it's because we've been so inundated with the fear porn that is coming out of every orifice of our media right now um, that people want to hear about it, but they want to hear about it in a way where there's something empowering with it as well. There's hope, there's solutions, there's a rich tradition. And I also believe there's something in our, our genetics, in our race memory, in our, uh, our psychological and spiritual memory, that there's a reason these stories are so powerful for us. And they're good teaching tools for us to reflect on as we navigate this very dark time that we live in. I could not agree more, man. I've, I got so much out of Lord of the Rings in the last year, as in I listened to it on audiobook and alternated between that and reading it twice within the last like six months. <laughs> I had to, I've also watched the whole trilogy twice in the last six months. One of the times I did it in a, full day marathon at a local theater where they played the extended versions back to back to back. And we just wow. went out there all day stretched during the uh, intermissions and kept at it. And it is, I, I, I'm so excited about the, everything that, that I feel when I'm in that space. And I, I don't mind going on that journey over and over again, because you find something new along the way each time. And there's so many 
archetypes that play in that that are able to actually guide us in a literal way, but through like the liminal space that is our imagination. I, I mean, I found this out to be very literal and true because a recent guest of mine is a hypnotic regression therapist who works with people's la past life memories. And after reading her book, I did some exercises in her book. And one of the exercises involved meeting a spirit guide. And one thing I liked about her work in general was that she never bothers to try to make a distinction between whether or not it's a literal separate spiritual entity that you encounter, or if your past life memories are like provably true, or if they're just something that's being generated by your unconscious to be symbolic of what it is that it wants to communicate to you. Either could be true or both could, uh, neither could be true or sometimes one, sometimes the other. But the point is for me, whenever I met a spirit guide, it was Gandalf, <laughs> like literally Gandalf came in, really? in this like visionary, uh, hypnotic inner meditative state and talked to me in the voice of Gandalf in the inflection with the same type of advice that he might give me if he was really here. I see you're busting out your Gandalf statue that you showed off during the live stream. Yeah, there he is. I got to show you. I got to show you because that was another synchronistic thing. You know, and that's amazing that he's kind of like a totem for me as a totem. This was one of my listeners, my longtime listeners. She handmade this. She does, pot she does uh, you know, pottery and sculptures and art. And she handmade this and shipped it out to me. It survived the trip. Thank God. And uh, I, I've just felt so connected to it ever since. And so I thought, okay, that's going to be my little my little power, my little spirit animal or whatever during the, the show. And so it's so funny how that all just came together. It, it is. I love that statue, by the way. It's, I'm jealous, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I, I, what I love about connecting with the archetypes through this type of myth is that uh, the archetypes live within us no matter wh whether we're listening to our unconscious and, and looking within or not. And as I've learned from listening to Michael's lectures on this type of subject on Unslaved and made the connection to my own personal experience, it's when we are ignoring our inner voice, that's when the archetypes come to us in the external world in a tyrannical way and try to, dis and try to destroy us, but not to destroy and kill us. It's actually all serving the imperial higher self. The archetypes appear to bring destruction to whatever parts of your <laughs> ego needs to be brought down in order you, for you to get back to the prime archetype, which is the creator. So there's a lot of different ways this can look for us, but whenever we're in the midst of everything seeming to fall apart externally, it is the ultimate call for us to find the deepest part of ourself, which is our capacity to create and our portal that is the imagination. So I mean, I'm glad to see that you're doing that exact thing by you using your creative capacities to pump out more content, more meaningful content than ever, and more volumes of content than ever, even in the midst of losing half your business, like you said. So I got to applaud that, man. Oh, thanks. I, I appreciate that. And your explanation of how that works, the archetypes, the deriving meaning from within during um, very chaotic external situations is, is brilliantly said. I wouldn't really add much other than just to say that when people learn how to see the world and how to see themselves through this lens, it's, that's, the, that's the healing. That's the solutions. This is where, you know, we often, the way we're taught to view the world is that the world is something happening to us. We're not taught to view the world as something we're participating in and that we're a part of and that there's a whole, there's a, there's a big spectrum of things that, that are part of that and that you have a purpose and you have a meaning and you have a reason for being here and that life does have purpose and meaning. And the reason why so many people feel like their life has no meaning is because they've been drawn into the matrix of this thought that is, oh, it's just a bunch, we're just a bunch of rocks flying around in space. You know, you're just a space monkey. You're, you're one in a, a bazillion, you know, you're, you're a meaningless speck of dust in the, in the quantum soup of the universe or whatever. And it's just like, no, that's just complete garbage. The, the great teachers, the great geniuses from all periods of time in history have come forward from Hermes to, uh, you know, all the, even you can find a lot of this kind of leftover throughout even the religious texts of the world, although they've done their very best to try to even hide that from you. Um, there's a, there's just a, 
there's so many amazing teachers out there that I never knew existed. There were concepts out there that I, I felt there was, there's gotta be something more to this life than just eat, sleep, shit, and die. There's gotta be something more to that, but I just never knew how to articulate it. I never knew how to express it. And so for me, it was a, a process of connecting to some of these great teachers, reading these books. I started off with people like Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts, the Tao Te Ching, uh, so many other great authors, a lot of the martial art, right? You know, Bruce Lee's writings and many other martial artists and just trying to find, you know, what are these people talking about when they're talking about meaning coming from within and all this kind of stuff. And then when you get your hands on something like Lord of the Rings and you can understand that the, the, the superficial narrative and the actual characters and the places and the, and the things that happen, it, it, that's there for your logical brain to be able to connect to it. But if you can get to the subtext of it, the esoteric side of that story, there's a deeper story to be told that only your subconscious and your intuition will understand. But you have to be able to remove the barriers of this, this lens that you're, that's become clouded. You know, what did William Blake say? When the doors of perception are cleansed, man will see everything as it really is, which is infinite. And th that statement changed my life. And I was always like, all right, I'm going to set out to see if Blake was true with this. And ever since I've started going on this journey of understanding archetypes, getting into uh, some of the great people that we cover on Unslaved and, and looking at things from multiple angles. Um, and even though you, you come across a, a great scholar or author where you might not agree with everything they say, it's not about creating consensus. It's about exploring thought, exploring ideas, thinking eclectically, and then bringing it all back into yourself. And then from within yourself, bringing forward that creativity and that expression of what you're going to do to put your unique spin on things, that's going to help empower you. And that's all I've ever tried to do. I'm not claiming to have come up with anything unique or anything like that. It's just, you know, my own creative way of basically telling my own story of my discovering these truths. And so, you know, you've got, when people think about archetypes, just some of the basics for people that are, might be just tuning into this idea you can go and start read about it. This was a term that was coined by Carl Jung. And he had four major archetypes and then many others. He had basically the persona, the shadow, the anima or animus, and the self. And then, of course, there's the other archetypes like the father, the mother, the child, the wise old man, the hero, the maiden, the trickster. And if you actually look at, this, at, the, big, um, at the descriptions of each of these archetypes that Jung laid out, and then you read Lord of the Rings, and you also read a lot of the private journals of J.R.R. Tolkien and people like that, you'll start to see that all of these archetypes that are within you are the fellowship of the ring and also Sauron and Saruman and all the dark characters as well. And what did Joseph Campbell say? All the heavens and hells, all the demons and angels, all the dragons and fairies, they all live inside of you. That's the story of myth. And that's how powerful myth can be. What the priest class has done is try to literalize the myth and the archetypes, because that's where the confusion sets in. And that's why we have competing religions that want to cut each other's throats for thousands and thousands of years for supremacy. And it becomes more about territorializing knowledge than it does about forming a relationship with knowledge. So this is where I believe religion went off its tracks, even though you can find some great truths in there. When you start to see that there's been um, actual manipulation of these concepts by the priest craft that got their hands on this, you can see where religion went wrong. So then you start asking yourself, well, okay, if these religions kind of got off the tracks, what was the original canon of knowledge that they all drew from? And that's where we get into the exploration of the self and decoding some of these things that even the Christ figure said in the Bible, which is things like the kingdom of heaven is neither near here nor there. The kingdom of heaven is within you. The first order of business is discover the kingdom of heaven. And where is it? It's within you. And it's as if a lot of these religious people forgot about that statement. They always look for it. Oh, it's after I'm dead. Heaven happens when I'm dead. Heaven happens when heaven comes to earth, like literally. And you know, I'm supposed to just worship this one savior deity and, and be completely externalized in my connection to nature and to God. And that's not the original intention. The original intention was the opposite, especially when Jesus is saying stuff like, hey, everything I can do, you can do in greater. So he's telling you what any of these characters in these movies and these books are. I'm the representation. I'm the, I'm the archetype for you to follow, to go on your own path of enlightenment and connection to God and nature and to self. And you're not to worship me. You're to 
your to form a relationship with knowledge, activate your holistic thought process, connect to your true inner well of heaven, and bring it forth into creation. And so this is a this is a way that this kind of ideology was what saved me. It saved my mind years and years ago. And I've been on this journey ever since. I still don't have it all figured out. I still feel like a bull in a china shop sometimes, but it's uh, it's still it, it's an ongoing thing, and it's an ongoing thing for everybody. And I encourage uh, people to look into it and feel into it, and then uh, feel free to let me know what you think about it. <laughs> Beautiful man, I was loving everything you're saying there, and for for myself when I the way that I cured the feeling of like emptiness or hollowness inside earlier in my adult life was when I started doing creative stuff, self-expression. When you look at the difference between the heroes and the, the evil in Lord of the Rings, the heroes are a group of individuals using their personal self-expression, their, their unique talents in concert, in synchronicity, without even necessarily needing to over, overly plan everything. Because when they're working, when they're following their true will, it's in alignment with the greater will of the cosmos of creation. So we don't even have to have any form of like control or well, the lesson there is that we don't have to have any like top down control of everything to make everything work out to, to everyone's highest benefit and to, you know, create abundance, that big spiritual buzzword or to, you know, just be happy and peaceful and free. It's actually something that is an automatic outcome whenever we are connected to our true will, because the true human nature is to be in harmony with other humans. It's not to to kill or go to war or to, to enslave others. That's a second nature that is instilled through fear and trauma. So looking at Lord of the Rings, I think is a really great way to be reminded that there is a reality of evil. And the, the great thing about it is that it's obvious in Lord of the Rings because you're seeing the metaphorical representation of what evil actually tries to do, which is to make subjugate a giant black shapeless mass of power under the dominion of one where, and it's like the polar opposite of what good goodness does, which is to ex give everybody not necessarily equality as a, an, something that's imposed on each other, but we have equality in freedom and equality in our, our desire to do good is equal to one another, whether you're Frodo or you're Aragorn working towards the same end without anyone needing to be in charge. And even the king, when the king returns, he's not a tyrant who passes down edicts from above and forces everyone to now be good. Everyone is so overjoyed that, <laughs> that this king has defeated darkness for them archetype, archetypically that you know, peace and happiness is an automatic outcome. And there's a cyclical nature to it that's also explored in The Lord of the Rings, which I find interesting that we have to return to this, this battle every so many generations and also multiple times in each individual person's life. But I think what's really interesting about the difference between you know, Middle Earth and current 2020 planet Earth is that the evil is so much more subtle due to the way people's perspective has been warped and the lies of cultural relativism and the solipsism that's so rampant where the, I mean, it's a really big concept that I confront all the time with people that are on a, a spiritual exploration path where they've been injected with this idea that truth is, you know, everyone has their own truth. But although there's some aspects of life where that is a fact that, you know, it's true that you have certain preferences that other people don't have, for example, what truth is, is actually objective reality. It's the only objectivity that can possibly exist. It's what really happened or what really is happening in a sense. It's looking at the universe with unclouded eyes. And <laughs> to go back to that, that William Blake quote, which I like to use all the time about cleansing the, the uh, windows of perception. So I guess maybe this would be a good time to talk a little bit about heroism itself and moral victory, as you were talking about in uh, your episode with Laura Lee, where in the first episode, you said something that really stuck with me, which is that achieving a moral victory requires choice. Choice requires freedom and freedom is exactly what the ring of power takes away. <laughs>
Chance, you're so awesome, man. I literally pulled up my notes and I'm like, oh, he's going to go to there. Okay. I'm going to get ready for this one. I got this little quote I'm going to read and you took, you got it. So thank you. That's amazing. We're right on the same uh, wavelength here. Uh, absolutely. The, you've highlighted so many important things that when we talk about the story, Lord of the Rings, and this is embedded. Remember, Lord of the Rings is a story that Tolkien wrote to summarize and to include myths and stories and legends that have existed in many traditions around the world. There's many correspondences to things like the Bhagavad Gita and things like that. But this is a unique story to the West. We say the West. We're talking about, of course, you know, the Western Hemisphere, the history of Western civilization and all of that. But what Tolkien was trying to get into in his story was the ideas, the concepts, the foundational principles that drove uh, the West originally, at least many of the ages. That doesn't mean there wasn't horrific periods of time in Western history. That doesn't mean there weren't great sins committed in history. It just means that we're like every other human being and every other civilization in the world where there has been um, error, mistakes, evil exists in each and every one of us as a potential. Uh, so we see it come, we see ama amazing brilliance coming from uh, everywhere. And we also see, you know, evil and corruption and, and, and negativity coming from other places as well. So this story sort of summarizes this, whether you're from Western culture or not, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a story for the entire world, but it's, it's specifically derived from the Western magical tradition. And there's a huge element in that story that discusses the nature of evil. And when we get into the nature of evil, and you just read it there, the story of achieving a moral victory in order to be able to do that, you need freedom. Okay. So those that want to do the opposite of that, those that don't want to operate with that as their modus operandi, who don't believe that, that the good is the direction that would be the best to serve humanity. They believe in chaos. They believe in disorder. They're, they're chaotic inside their own psyche. So they're going to project that. If you look up psychological projection, just go on the internet, look it up right now. You'll see that we project our shadow. This is from Jung as well. We project our shadow onto others and onto the world. And we don't understand what that shadow is. We don't understand those, that part of the archetype. We don't want to admit that we have this as a potentiality. And so what we do is we create these fantasies like, oh, it's morally re moral relativism. Everything is just everything else. And uh, the, everything's just shades of gray. There's no objective reality. There's no objective truth. There's no reason for morality. There's no reason for heroism. Um, all we need to do is create a big super state structure like the eye of Sauron and Mordor. And it, we just need some intellectual elites to rule humanity because humanity is just a bunch of space monkeys that have no meaning or purpose. And so this, this is where it comes in. It, it, it comes in with a flawed belief system and a skewed worldview. And, and that comes from, if you start studying psychopaths and the sociopathic psychology, criminal psychology, which we touched on briefly, and we're going to be getting into more in this series, you'll understand that um, this is how that type of mindset actually functions. And so we have to admit, number one, bottom line, we have to admit that evil exists. It's not some abstract religious concept. And I'm speaking to you about evil from outside of the religious canon, okay? So we can turn to religious texts, we can analyze it, but I'm an objective researcher. So I look at it as, okay, if I go to the bug, if I go to uh, traditions coming out of India or China, the, the Far East, Japan, uh, what, the West, if you go around the world, you will find different renditions of this exact story and this exact truth that there is a potentiality in all of us for great evil. So we all, and, and what the Lord of the Rings tells us is how that process operates. And there's so many times in the Lord of the Rings, and it's really brought out beautifully in the first one, the, the Fellowship of the Ring, where you have these characters uh, that like Boromir and many others who get attracted to this ring and who want to use it for good. They want to use the ring of power for good. And that's the interesting story in this myth is that many good people have been swindled into believing that the ends justify the means that we we can use these this type of evil as a way of good and all these kinds of things and that's where you start getting into the whole moral relativism debate and so what has to happen is you have to have this pure soul like frodo who comes out and he's the only one who can bear the ring because he's still in that state of innocence he's still in that state of uh 
you know, there's something about him that's unique, even though he could be considered the hobbits would be considered, you know, it's kind of like the average folk, right? The average folk who have no, their ignorance is bliss. We don't know what's going on in middle earth about dark Lords and wizards and great battles. We're going to just ignore that. We just want to party. We just want to have our little community. It's the, it's the, in, the nescient kind of uh, person. And we all have that in us. It's like the fool, the path of the fool in the tarot. It's a very similar thing. And yet they don't employ great warriors and wizards and magicians to go and deal with this ring of power. They have an average person, a young hobbit, that's going to be the only one that is able to resist the power of the ring long enough in order to, dr- to destroy it. And it's just, a, it's just, there's so much in there that it, you can pull out of it. And what I pull out of it is that, okay, number one, we have to admit that evil exists. When we start looking into what's happening in the real world right now, the world we live in, and we start looking into some of the really dark things that do happen. If I were to have this debate with somebody, if they're trying to say, well, no, evil is just relative and it's just a term we use and it comes from religion and we got to get rid of it and it's outdated. I'm like, okay, tell that to all of these child pedophilic sex trafficking rings. Tell that to these gangs, these MS-13 gangs. Tell that to this, these ISIS uh, terrorist organizations. Tell that to the George Soroses of the world and the banking elite that have completely robbed you and your ancestors for generations. Um, you know, and tell me again that evil doesn't exist. And once you've had direct experience with that level of evil, your life is forever changed. And it's not that we talk about these things or even that Tolkien was bringing this up to further traumatize you. In fact, it's the opposite. The only reason we have any kind of anxiety or fear that stays with us, right? Like this sort of like this toxic fear, because I do, I talk a lot about how there's a need for fear. There's a reason you have it. It's a survival mechanism. If you did away with it, you, you would have no, no uh, controls to stop you from running out onto the road when a car's coming, et cetera, right? We understand that. But when fear lingers with you, it becomes this angst, this something that is, it's a myth in your mind, or not even a myth, that's not the right word. It's, a, it's an illusion in your mind. Then that's where we have a problem. And that starts to decay the mind. They call it fear is the mind killer. And if you actually get into the nature of evil, you will see that fear and evil have a really tight relationship. And so even what you would call good people, you're like, oh, that's a good people. All those, all those people in the Soviet Union that were clapping for Stalin and the gulags and all those good people in, the, in Nazi Germany that were cheering on Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah, save us. And all those good people that signed up for Jim Jones's cult and then ended up giving their children poison to kill. Because, you know, and on and on we could go. They believed they were good people. They, they, they meant well. Everybody means well. But the fact of the matter is meaning well isn't good enough. It's not enough to mean well. That's not how you combat evil. Evil preys on the fact that you're just out there meaning well. And I think a lot of people have this cartoonish image of evil as being something that's very overt and it's in your face and it's easy to detect. And it's this, you know, sharp bone structured witch-like face that's sitting around a dark table. <laughs> We're just doing all these weird satanic rituals and it's this evil thing. No, no, no. Evil is a lot more subtle than that. And that's the message is that it, it, will, it will capture even the most brilliant people. It will capture some of the most moral people and it will sway them into this sort of dark side of the force. And um, when you see that, you could go, oh, now I'm scared of it. And you could just close up and say, I never want to hear about it again. Or you can do what Young is suggesting and many others who would say, no, no, integrate the shadow, learn about the shadow in yourself, learn about your past, learn about your fear, study your fear, make it a study, put it out in front of you naked to see, expose your fear to yourself. Don't, don't, when you feel fear, don't just go, oh, I don't don't want that. Put up the wall, put up the blinders, repress it. Repression is just planting a seed of evil inside of yourself and in your consciousness, whereas expression is the way you do it. So you don't express it by going on mass murdering sprees, that's for sure, but you express it by art, martial arts, um, studying the nature of, uh, you know, just as simple as doing some kind of calligraphy or whatever, right? Um, You're learning about yourself. You're learning about your fears. And when you do that, you come out better. And I referenced that quote from Vernon Howard, who said, human sickness is so severe, but those who dare to look at it will become well. So there's a healing process in studying evil. First of all, recognize that it exists, studying it, getting it out of yourself, or at least 
understanding it in your potentiality for it and, and your motivations as to why you would want to seek the ring of power over others, right? Or why you'd want to subjugate even those other voices in your head to your fear. Your fear could be looked at as that ring of power that sort of rules over your mind. It's the, it's the watcher that's always paranoid and looking for enemies everywhere and looking for reasons to, you know, and, and the self-criticism and all that. But if you learn how to understand it and get into it and expose it, then the light can shine through. And it's a process. It's not easy. And it's interesting that as human beings that we have to actually go through this process. And I started asking myself, well, why do we have to do this? Why does evil exist? Well, this gets you into understanding the nature of trauma. And trauma is another huge, huge component to this, um, where great trauma from the ancient past has affected all of us. That has flowed through the genetic lines and through the filogenetic memories of our ancestors up to the present day. And then whatever's happening in your life, in your personal life now, that is further traumatizing you. And whatever the orgs of the world, the, the media, the, the, all this stuff kind of coming down with constant fear, 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 fear. That's them, as Michael likes to say, pulling the rug from under your feet. Just, just you know, keeping it a nuisance, keeping you in trauma, keeping you in angst and anxiety. And then that's the kind of person that's easy to control. And if you don't understand that there are people that have committed themselves to that way of being, that they, they are control freaks and that they have murdered their, their self. They've murdered that archetype that Jung is talking about, the self. They've murdered that at the expense of this ring of power archetype. And it, we, you can see examples of this in your own personal life. We don't need to talk about bankers and, and all these other people. You, you've seen this in your own personal life on, on micro levels. All you have to do to understand how the psychopath works is to get into it and you can magnify it times a thousand and then you'll understand what's really going on. And then now that you know that you do have an enemy in the grass that's ready to hunt you down and subjugate you and that there's a whole history of how this works and that the deeper mystery here is that you want it. If you have no inner power within you and you have no ability to do this on your own, you will be looking for someone to do it for you. You'll be looking for an external savior. And what if that external savior, I mean, because we all need teachers and guides and people to inspire us, right? But what if we come upon and we bow at the feet of some savior that props themselves up in front of us and they don't have our best interests in mind. In fact, they seek our destruction. What if we get on, you know what I mean? And so that's what I did in my cult series was I went into that and said, okay, here's a, here's a whole bunch of examples of where good, well-meaning people got hooked into this and got blinded by the light, so to speak, and were brought into a form of mind control in a way. And here's the fallout of that. Here's how it's happened. And if we can know that, we can guard against that happening again. And we can guard against that happening in our own lives. And so that's sort of a long answer form as to what I feel Lord of the Rings brings us as a myth to bring these truths to our attention so that we can confront the evil that exists in this world today, right now. So awesome. Lots to unpack here. I mean, I, I wasn't sure if we'd talk about Lord of the Rings tangentially for this long, but I'm really glad that, and, and I'm not surprised actually that it seems like it's probably going to just weave its way in and out of this conversation, even as we hit other topics. But what happens when someone joins a cult is that they are afraid, of course, the, the rule of the ruling ring in their mind is their fear that they don't know what to do or they don't know how to live life correctly. Or they've been given this idea that if they do live life incorrectly, they're going to go to hell, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of ways that this trap is laid, but then essentially what you have is a person who's incapable of decision making. It's actually a form of indecisiveness that comes from the fear because fear is a constrictor. You know, you talked about repression. Constriction is another way of looking at that. Love is the force that expands and allows us to see the infinite potential in things because when you love somebody or you love something, you want to see it grow into whatever it is destined to grow into instead of controlling what it becomes. And fear is only able to see one outcome. Like in The Lord of the Rings, everyone that becomes seduced by the power of the ring, their fear is that the, the victory of Sauron is inevitable. So we have to do this. The good guys, if you will, they don't know how exactly they're going to pull it off, but they know that if they know it's possible to do it. And they know that 
they have one step ahead of them. They need to go to the Pass of Caradras. They need to go through the Mines of Moria. Now we need to go through the Forest of Lothlorien. They don't know exactly what's going to happen any phase of the journey. They don't know what's coming up next, but they take the next step in faith that doing the right thing is their actual only choice if they want to defeat the evil. And so this ties into the idea of creativity quite well, because I've had a pet theory about the artist for a long time, which is that the difference between a creative person and a non-creative person is that the creative person is decisive, whereas the person who thinks they're not creative is actually mistaking that for being indecisive. They look at the canvas or they look at the page or they start the recording and they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to paint. I don't know what to say. The artist, however, knows that all that they have to do is take the first step and then the next step will be more obvious to them as they go. Paint the background, paint a shape, you know, just start talking, see what comes in the flow state will engage from there. And the flow state of the artist is very much like the synchronistic flow that occurs on the hero's journey where the right person and the right thing always appear and happen at the exact timing that needs to happen for victory over evil. So there's a huge connection there to self-expression as a, an artist to what it actually means to fight evil. So people like you and I, we don't know exactly how we're going to overcome this <laughs> imposition of one world government and the tyranny of our current situation. But we do know that our next step is to keep talking about it, keep exploring it, keep researching it, keep trying to get this information to the people that are ready to hear it. And hopefully people hearing this now will realize that it's just one step at a time on the journey to Mount Doom. There's no other way to conceptualize it. Your mind can't do all of that. That's what it means to be actually talking to and guided by your unconscious, which is that you let all of the totality of things be where they are inside you and you can only be and you just pay attention to what you're conscious of right now instead of being afraid that you need to master every aspect of something before you even embark on a quest right so <laughs> all oh, this absolutely. so all, all of this is leading to kind of my next question is maybe transitioning to talking about our current the current crisis if you will and how we can help people understand the sacred aspect of Western civilization and what's in jeopardy right now that we want to preserve and why, how, how and why we've been lied to about Western civilization in general and <laughs> what's actually worth saving about it, which is quite a bit whenever you start to unpack it. Chance, man, I love talking to you. It's brilliant. I love what you're saying about the creativity. You said it's so good. And uh, just that's people, stuff people need to put up on their wall right now. Um, and it's also what's going to give you hope. We, we need to have hope at all times. And even like you said, there, how many moments in that Lord of the Rings movie or, or book where they, they were thinking, this is hopeless. It's, all, it's over. We're, we're done. You know, Gollum's going to get the ring and uh, the, 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 they're going to storm the wall and they're going to crash through and everybody's going to be taken out and we're not going to be able to fight back. And there's so many moments where it all hung on a thread. It all hung on a hope. It, it, they didn't think there was anything that was really going to work out. And then it ended up obviously working out in the end because that's how, that's how, that's the process of your own creativity coming forward is that you will doubt yourself every step of the way. There's that voice of doubt in your head. It's like, even you could look at the archetypes of the 12 disciples, which are also just archetypes of the 12 signs of the Zodiac and the 12, and on and on we could go with the number 12. You have 12 cranial nerves in your head. Did you know that? Um, anyways, but the, the 12, one of them was the doubting, right? Doubting Thomas, he's the doubter. And then you had the betrayer, you had Judas the betrayer. And they had, there was uh, people that, it, it, what was that story also in 300, the 300 Spartans, you had the, the betrayer in that story who came from a place of envy. Envy was the betrayer. Uh, so th these are age old. So when you think about Western civilization, what it is and why are we trying to preserve it? I could sum it up in one word. And that word is the principle of freedom. Okay. And we're talking freedom. I was talking about this with somebody recently and differentiating between the terms liberty and freedom. There is a difference. I prefer the word freedom, although I understand what people say when they say liberty. But to me, liberty means I have the liberty to do whatever the hell I want at the expense of anybody. I, you know, it's free. It's a free. There's no borders in the world. There's no borders around my home. There's no doors that I lock. There's no, uh, there's no reason for any of these things. There's nothing worth protecting. It's just completely, completely liberal, libertine. This is the whole concept, right? How many times do we hear people like 
Karl Marx and Stalin and Hitler and uh, you know, Nero and all that talk about liberty and how we have to be, you know, even the, the founding um, elements of the, of the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati, which yes, it did exist and I think still exists, was liberty, fraternity, and what was it? Liberty, fraternity, and something else. Anyways, but they, liberty was one of the main keys. And you go, oh, well, then aren't these guys the good guys? Aren't they the good guys? And when you understand how to decipher these terms, you'll understand the difference between liberty and freedom because liberty is something that a government grants you. Freedom is something that is the ground of your being. And it comes from, you could say nature, you could say spirit, you could say the universe, you could say God, you could say God's, whatever, I don't care, whatever your schemata is in your head of what you perceive to be the moving force of this universe that causes the galaxies to swirl in perfect mathematical synchronicity. And even the fact that right now your body is going through an orchestra of Lord of the Rings battles all the time on different levels, you know, whatever that force is that is the prime mover, it operates with this principle of freedom. So when we figured that out in the West, that we should be grafting our systems on the principle of nature and on the principle of freedom and on the principle of God in the truest sense, not this religious crock of shit that they give you about what God is, the real thing that you can only get from the great genius minds of the world and the great thinkers and the great sages and the great writings and the great myths, and that you can eventually get from within yourself because it's all embedded in you, right? That's what we're worth. That's what we're trying to preserve. And then when you realize that even on an economic level, even on a product productivity level, that when you give people freedom, freedom means, and just, let me just, before I, I'll pause that freedom versus Liberty. So Liberty is just, I can come in your house, take what I want when I want, if I want to sleep with your wife, if I want to take your children for some to go work in my farm, there's nothing you can do to stop me because I'm free to do whatever I want. And how dare you impose on anything on me? That's, that's how that mind works, right? Freedom works with a, an agreement between human beings that understands sovereignty, individual sovereignty, meaning that I'm free, but I'm not free to take your freedom away. That's the difference. That's the difference. And when we figured that out, in the West, we created the first system ever that it wasn't perfect. It was the beginning stages of a new, a, new, a new idea, a new experiment that was to say, we value reason, real scientific inquiry. We, we value giving the individual in our society status and protection so that a mob can't just show up and force its will upon you because it's a mob that you still as an individual are protected to go about your business so long as you are not hurt, harming others or do whatever, but you're, you're, you're given status. And the reason we figured it out was because it was individuals that formed the most brilliant aspects of Western civilization. It wasn't groups of people. It wasn't collectives of people. It wasn't uh, you know, all the people running around at Walmart looking for toilet paper. It wasn't that level of human consciousness. It was something that only you as an individual can possibly conjure. That brilliance, that genius that Walter Russell was talking about, right? He said, mediocrity is self-imposed and genius is self-bestowed. You don't make your choice. What are you going to be? Mediocre or a genius? Okay. It doesn't have anything to do with your IQ. It has any, everything to do with your ability to peer into the nature of your being and then bring forth your creative potential. So we said, we're going we're gonna to cherish this. We're going to elevate the individual to a status in our, in our myth, in our story, even have people like Jordan Peterson going back into even the biblical stories and, and coming back and saying, yeah, the story of the Christ character is the story of the individual. And the fact that the individual has to die at the foot of the collective. And that's just how it always has been. But before that individual gets hung or, or, or thrown into the fire or whatever, or put into a gulag somewhere, usually they end up creating something that allows the entire species to leap forward whether in their thinking or in technological developments or whatever. So go back and look at, I always tell people when they're like, oh, we, we have to trust the scientists, trust the consensus right now. It's like, well, what do you mean the consensus? Because science was built off the premise that we're not going to have that. We're not going to have mob rule. We're run off who, who's right. It's who's who. That's another thing with the West is it's the truth. The logos was something that was elevated above all else. The logos that you can only receive from what? From God? Sure. Call it what you want. Where does God live? Inside of you and inside of everything. So if you're going to allow that to be your ruling principle, 
Well, now you can start to do some math and understand that Western civilization became as successful as it did, not just because it was out there enslaving and doing all this kind of stuff, which there was definitely that part, but that was something that was universal all over the world. We could talk about that endlessly. There were differences in the West because of the fact that we created something based off certain guiding principles that proved to be obviously now the envy of the world, which is why everybody's coming here and we're not going over there. And it's not because we don't like those people. It's not because we don't like those other areas of the planet. It's because those areas of the planet are run by different principles, which lead to poverty, destruction, corruption, and tyranny. We've seen it cropping up in the West for some time. And if we would be left alone for five minutes, we would fix it and we would route out these traitorous worm tongues and we would fix the problem. But the fact that we're being looked at now as the enemy of the world is ludicrous. And so people like me come out and say, no, no, no. And, and Michael and so many others, better people than me, have come out and warned and said, hey, there's a true story here to be told. This is a principle that you should take as an example to follow, not as something to destroy and replace with what we've already seen as causes nothing but destruction. So we're not in a state, we don't, in the West, the, the traditions of the West are we don't elevate the collective above the individual. We allow the individual to work freely, to generate the logos from within and the creativity from within, to apply mind and reason and intuition to the work, to uh, inspire many people. They think of the Bruce Lees of the world and the the singular people that went out and created great things, the people who invented the bridges and and the way to build the bridges and the individuals that invented airplanes and the individuals, you know, think about it, just endless Even this technology we're using wasn't created by a hive of people. It was created by individuals who were left alone by the government to do it. And then now we have the concept in place for allowing prosperity to come to the collective, to come to everybody else. So by destroying the individual and the freedom of the individual, you completely handicap the evolution of that culture and society and that civilization. And all you need to do, guys, is go back and compare the history of China to the history of the West. And I just did a whole thing, and and I'll tell you why. I have nothing but the greatest respect for Chinese civilization, history. Uh, Many of my mentors come from there. The martial arts come from there. Um, they, they, they've invented some incredible things. You know, they've been through their period of, of, of absolutely bringing this concept forward as well. But then we had this period known as the great leap forward in China. And there's a whole history there where there was a major imposition of communism and many of these ideologies that ended up turning it away from its original intention. And we didn't have the mass uprising of the people. Uh, they've tried in many cases, but haven't successfully overthrown that power over there. And now that is something that is now, I feel, trying to spread its way around the world. Um, And it wasn't just something that originated in one geographical area. This is an ideology that comes from some very dark Luciferian type uh, cult-like entities that we could get into that um, were essentially looking to disrupt the natural flow of what I feel was going on in China with the expansion of their culture and civilization. And they're trying to do the exact... And so they already tested this out on that demographic. And now that's being brought into the West to overthrow the institutions and the ideologies here. So this is where I come in and go, okay, we really now have to go back and look at that question that you've asked me. What is it? Why is it worth preserving? How do we differentiate from all the the, the propaganda and the nonsense out there from what the truth is? And how can we save the best parts of uh, humanity? How can we save the the structures that are there to support the ideology of freedom and why is it valuable? And so these are very important discussions to have. And there's so many different angles that we can weave into it to help people understand this. Yeah, there, there really are a lot of ways to understand this. I'm glad that you brought up communism because I think as an ideology, it's either started out this way or it's become a type of egregore in the collective psyche, an actual on its own, standing on its own and influencing people through the psychic space in a a way akin to like demonic possession. It's it's really wild. I think even Karl Marx, if you look into some of his uh, other hobbies, was into types of like black, black magic or Satanism. I've heard that he even claimed to have been getting some of his ideas channeled from a an, another type of like non-human intelligence. So just like there's 
just like in the really ancient myths, there are forces even beyond humanity, and they could be looked at as the the uh, sort of cloud of consciousness that is where our our individual sparks are deriving from, and it, within that, there is actual pure primeval evil as well as actual pure love and goodness. And the reason for that is because what what even allows for free will to exist has to be the fact of evil. Like the devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder, those, that's not really a devil and an angel. That's actually the manifestation of the logos or God. That's what it means. When you are ready to do something that is going to be out of sync with nature or with your fellow humans, you get that conscience, that voice that chimes in and says something. And that's your point of having the opportunity to make a free will decision. So essentially the thing that people call God is literally freedom. <laughs> that's what you mean when you say it's at the, uh, the base of what it means to be human. Thanks for spending so much time with us. Of course, if you do have anything that you want to say in closing, please be my guest. And at the very least, let people know with a reminder all the ways that they can connect with you and access your content and all the the web many websites you're a part of so uh, yeah thanks for spending so much time with me here today man this was just as good as i knew that it would be i was really stoked on this one and it did not disappoint uh, i feel really fired up so thank you my aries brother fellow aries brother <laughs> always uh always gets wild whenever two aries come together and start stoking the fire in each other. It's fun. Absolutely, Chaz. I always love talking to you, man. And again, I salute you for your work. I, I hope people keep coming back to your show. And all I want to say is that, you know, we skipped, we, we stopped at a lot of different, or not stopped, we, uh, we visited a lot of different subjects today. And there's obviously so much that we could unpack on every little point. Um, I, I've done it endlessly on my show, Way of the Truth Warrior. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me at DW Truth Warrior on Instagram. I've been sharing a lot of stuff on my Instagram page as of late, both inspirational, philosophical, and real world, uh, conspiratorial, like a little bit of everything. It's a nice little smorgasbord there. Um, but, you know, the main thing is that don't even take what I'm saying as just some kind of word of, uh, of what you should just follow blindly. You should not follow anybody blindly. You should take what you hear. You should, whether it challenges you or whether it inspires you, and you should bring it into yourself and think about it and research it on your own. Um, I didn't call my show Truth Warrior because I'm sitting there saying, I've got the truth. Listen to me. I'm not trying to start a cult. I'm not trying to convert anybody. This is my perspective based on what I have. I share it with you. And I also love hearing feedback from people and having uh, free-flowing discussions with people about this. So I just want to always encourage people to make this your journey. Um, and any of the subjects that we talked about that you have questions on, you know, try to get in touch. Contact me um, on Unslaved. You can go hit us up at unslaved.com. I have two memberships there. One is a basic for $6 a month. You get access to our entire uh, show archive, which is, uh, it's, it's huge. There's hundreds of hours there for you. Then I have a $12 uh, package, which is the premium. And that's where you get all of the exclusive content, which there's thousands of hours of. Um, and that's what allows us to keep going. That's what keeps this whole operation working. So all the support is, is much appreciated. And I feel we give, uh, we give out far more than we're asking for. So it's definitely a good deal. But Again, uh, I just want to thank you, Chance, for giving me this opportunity to share, to talk about so many subjects. I'm sure we could make a podcast out of each one if we really dove into it. So we'll have to do this again sometime. And I definitely look forward to you coming on as a guest on Unslaved in May. And we'll have to let people know about that once we get closer to the date. But that's going to be a good conversation, no doubt. Oh, yeah. I've always wanted to uh, get a chance to meet Michael, too. So I'm pretty excited about it myself. I just had happened to send him a message about Becca Tarnas, the uh, Lord of the Rings researcher I did a show with. And he was like, oh, well, this is great. But while we're at it, you want to come on? And I was like, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And then it took me a while to even kind of conceptualize in my mind what I would want to bring to that bring to the episode that hasn't been talked about yet. But I've got some ideas and I think we're going to have a fun time. So yeah, the, the main goal of this episode, other than to inspire people to take action as the creator in their own life, is to direct them to the content that you've been making for all this time. And that's why I brought up so many various subjects like Ralph and like the uh, 
the Bach saga. And that's just literally the tip of the, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. That's like one snowflake on top of the iceberg that is uh, <laughs> unslaved and your truth warrior channel. So thanks for all the tireless, relentless effort that you're putting in. And thanks for once again, for coming in to interverse and blowing it all wide open. We'll definitely do it again later down the road and uh, take care out there, man. Thanks again, Chance. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And I can't wait till next time. All right, guys, here we are at the end of another episode. Thank you, David, for coming back on the show. David Whitehead, personal hero of mine, makes it all the more appropriate that we were talking about heroism. (laughs) Really awesome stuff. And especially cool that we got to discuss Lord of the Rings because that's been a huge thing on my mind for, I guess, my whole life, but especially the last half a year or so. We just did some Lord of the Rings content. There's more coming up. And it's pretty much an inexhaustible source of wisdom and inspiration, which is why I guess we would call it the guiding myth of our times as we did in this podcast episode. So make sure that you are following David on his Truth Warrior channel on YouTube, where you can hear his amazing epic long live streams with Laura Lee Skate, where they talk about a lot of Lord of the Rings related stuff and draw on the amazing symbolism and narrative in that tale to bring out even more ideas about heroism and about (laughs) the esoteric nature of truth. Anyway, it's been a really awesome time talking with David, like I said, and I'm excited to be also putting this one out as a video episode. Like I said at the beginning, if you're checking out the audio only version of this podcast, this is published on YouTube with full video, which I rarely do. And I wanted to quote David from this episode. You probably remember him saying this, but he said, when you seek truth and knowledge with the purpose of forming a relationship with it, as opposed to trying to own it like the ring of power, unseen forces come to your aid. I think this is a super important aspect of becoming heroic, this idea. And I think it's good to know that the winds of the cosmos will be at our backs when we seek truth, justice, beauty, goodness, all those type of things. But I also think we should act as righteously as we can even in the face of opposition, with the assumption that we don't have any backup coming, that it's all on us, that we've got to take care of it ourselves, that we have to be completely personally responsible, because there's never a guarantee that life is always going to give us the (laughs) Excalibur right when we need it, give us everything that we need in the moment, Deuce, (laughs) deuce ex machina style, the God in the machine, that literary device that is so often criticized. Because sometimes we have to fail. We have to fall down with our swords drawn because that defeat might be necessary to teach us something very important. And not expecting any saviors makes it all the more significant when synchronicity does unfold in our favor, which it is going to do quite often. You can trust that, but you should also act like it's not a thing. I don't know. That's kind of my take on it. Of course, I say should a lot, but this is your life. I'm just giving you ideas that come into my head. I guess that's what this is all about. And this idea of seeking truth and knowledge with the purpose of forming a relationship with it, following your conscience, acting in concert with natural law and the will, the higher will of creation itself. This is what it means to be acting in the capital S self instead of the lowercase s self, as I like to put it. The will of creation, which is also your will at the highest or deepest level both, I guess. (laughs) The the analogy I like to use is that we have a higher self, we have some connection to a spiritual plane where we're more connected to the all-knowing, to the Akashic record, if you want to call it that. And that part of ourself is like the coach that's up in the top of the stands during a football game that's watching the game from above and radioing, radioing down to the quarterback telling him what play to run because he can see everything on the field. He's been watching the patterns and the quarterback just trusts in that play and executes it. And the other players know what to do when he calls the play and they all work in concert. It's kind of like that. So whenever you're acting out of the deepest compassion that you have for others, when you're acting out of love, when you're acting out of anything heroic, you are going to be playing, running a play that, the universe called for you. (laughs) 
it's a ch- it's like a challenge or it's like a test, if you will. And I think whenever we see our lives running into like anti synchronicity and everything's going wrong constantly, it could be an indicator that we need to look at what we're doing that we shouldn't be that we know is hurting us or we know is out of sync, out of harmony, because that could be the thing that's keeping the rest of the pieces from falling into place correctly, from activating that synchronicity. But like I said, don't rely on it. Just to, just enjoy it when it happens because it will happen a lot. Unseen forces will come to your aid. And another thing that we didn't talk a lot about in David's chat with me just now, I mean, we talked about some tangential topics, but he has this entire series called Cults of Death and Power. I mean, it's only three episodes, but they're three or four plus hours long each. And he live streamed them, which is a heroic feat in itself. And it's a gruesome topic for sure. But if it's not something you've researched before, if you don't know a lot about cults and the history of some of the crazier ones that have happened in the last century or two, it's worth checking out because you really want to see the depths of what's possible, just how far humanity can fall just how far you can get out of sync with your own highest will. Some of the cults that he talks about in that series are the Jim Jones cult, Charles Manson's group, the Heaven's Gate cult, and a lot more. Heaven's Gate is the one where they thought if they killed themselves as the hale Bob comet came by the planet, that they would somehow get beamed up to the alien mothership. Amazing that you could convince a bunch of people of that, but... It was done. And so these people, like 39 people, ate poison pudding and poison applesauce. They laced it with, I don't know, something that killed them pretty quick, I guess. And the wildest thing is they did it in three shifts while the next group came in and cleaned up after the one that had just off themselves before it. So they're seeing all their cohorts laying there dead and poisoned and, you know, goop dribbling out of their mouth and had to have been super disturbing but they still went through it themselves and there's just something to be said about group think and about mass hysteria and how real these things are and even though it might not be immediate suicide there's a lot of elements to our culture where people just do what everyone else is doing even though it's not good for them not good for anybody Another crazy thing about Heaven's Gate is they still have an active website. You can literally go Google Heaven's Gate and find their website. It's still online. It looks like it's from the 90s, but I don't know who's paying to host that or why it's still up. It's very strange that it exists without you having to go to the Wayback Machine. So you can look that up if you want. And the Jim Jones cult, that's another really weird one. David plays a lot of video clips of people in his congregation who are like worshiping him as a God, practically. It's really chilling to see, but it's important to understand what's possible in terms of mind control. I think I should tell you guys about the plus extension. Now, if you are not on interverse plus get on there, you get the second hour of this podcast and all the other extended episodes for a mere $5 a month, very little in the grand scheme of things. You'll be helping me make this a better show, spend more time on this show, move away from doing other types of work that are not as much in alignment for me in terms of what I feel like I'm here to do. And you get to win too. You get the second hour. Like I said, it's a win-win. So be my hero and sign up for Plus if you want to know what we talked about in this episode. A little preview. We discussed the secret war of the early Catholic Church against the ancient Nordic Finnish civilization, which has come down to us through a mythology, if you will, but it may be more of a legend. Definitely seems to be based in history. It's called the Bach Saga. They get into that on the Unslaved podcast a lot, and I wanted to touch on it, and we did touch on it. The most interesting thing about that was how, and we talked about this in the Plus Extension, was that the fear-based worldview of the concept of hell, for example. I mean, that was something that kept people in check and following the edicts of the priests for a long time. They believed they're going to go to hell if they didn't. You know, this idea, though, was actually just manufactured as a, another nail in the enslavement coffin. And in the, according to the box saga, the original location of a place called hell that was like a real place was not scary or evil at all. It was a center of high civilization that was basically wiped off the map by 
the early church. So pretty crazy. When you think about the word hell that scares people so bad, it was a bad word, H-E double hockey sticks. Think about all the other words that actually begin with hell that are good things like health. He, uh, heal is very close to, to hell. Help. Yeah, I don't think I have to even go on and on. Just look into that for yourself and wonder why is something that when it's a prefix to a word, it means a good word. Why is that a bad thing? And even hell in like Nordic mythology was not really the hell type of uh, lake of fire underworld that it is in Christianity. It was more of a, just a natural cycle. I think that souls would visit there. I don't know enough about that particular mythology to continue on the topic, but I am very interested in why every third person you meet is afraid that you're going to hell. If you don't believe the way they do, it's weird. Also in the plus extension, we talked about other elements of esoteric history, like the original figure who was turned into the character of Jesus and also to the character of King Arthur. That's a really crazy one Uh, on enslaved. They get into the work of Ralph Ellis and they interview him several times because it's such a huge can of worms where they go and find the mythographers, if you will, the historical individuals who created the mythology of Christianity out of chopping up some components of astro theology, you know, astrology, as well as real events, real rebellions against the Roman Empire and made that all into the new religion for the slaves. And, and, uh, you know, you may have an esoteric perspective on Christianity. It may be what you consider your faith. It may be something empowering for you. But we do talk about in the plus extension, the pros and cons of that particular philosophy and other modern day Abrahamic religions and where some of those ideas are definitely in the slave mentality type of territory. So I'm not trying to knock on someone's religious beliefs if they've got them. I just have to speak my mind. I see what I see and I'm going to talk about it. And if it challenges you, maybe that's a good thing. If it makes you feel more strong in the faith that you've got, that's great too. As long as we're all working towards the betterment of humanity, I I don't care what you believe. (laughs) We're all on the same team. More than the plus extension was talking about communism and the Vatican's cozy relationship with the religions of atheism, scientism, and statism. And a very lesser known fact is that the Vatican had a hand in the creation of everything from Protestantism, Islam, to communism. All kinds of very interesting links that you can get up to when you start looking for them. Also in the plus extension, we talked about martial arts and working with the body to evolve the mind and spirit and David's training at home video series that he has on Patreon, which I personally love. I've done it a bunch. I've been, it's not all of them, but some of them's like weapons training. I don't have nunchucks, but I've done a lot of that home workouts he put out there. Very helpful during quarantine when there's no gyms open. We talked about staying grounded and balancing the proverbial earth and sky energies within and about reawakening the warrior and the armor of truth and moral virtue. Of course, that's not everything we talked about. There was a lot in there. So get on the plus extension. If you're not, you definitely won't regret it if you like Interverse at all. And I'll be very happy with you. Hooray, if you sign up, because it'll make me excited to know that there's one more person out there getting this extended content that I think is so good. You know, it's juicy, man. You don't get into the best stuff in the first hour. It's just kind of impossible. You have to build things up. You have to work your way there. You have to get warm. So I really like this episode. I'm also going to be on David's podcast, Unslaved with Michael Tessarion, uh, this weekend. So if you do decide to go check out what they're doing over there, become a member with them as well, you'll be able to hear me talk on that podcast and I've got some uh, interesting new stuff in the works. I'm preparing my own research presentation, which is not something I do very often, but I do a lot of research on topics for podcast guests in general. So usually I'm asking the questions instead of presenting the information, but I think it shouldn't be too difficult for me to turn that around. 
And I've had some practice with a few other shows that I've been on recently, like that wild uh, episode of the Conspiracists podcast, which you can find linked on my website that I did a couple of weeks ago. That's a good example. Or the philosophy guy where I talked about idealism and panpsychism. That was also really fun. Love talking philosophy. But now I'm going to get out of here and play us out in the outro with Shadow Wand, a song by Michael Tessarion, the co-host of the David Works With on Unslaved. He's also an incredible guitar player, and I've enjoyed his music and been inspired by what he does to try some different guitar stuff myself whenever I make time for it. So it's a little different than my usual electronic music jam, but I think it's fitting for this particular episode on a variety of levels. So check the show notes for links to everything I talked about, links to David Whitehead, links to this song Shadow Wand by Michael Tessarion, links to Interverse Plus where you can become a member. And one last time, thank you, David Whitehead, if you're still listening at this point. (laughs) Been great getting to work with you. Look forward to doing more stuff in the future because... Things are definitely just going to keep getting weirder in the outside world. And uh, truth is becoming more and more of a rare commodity. A lot of people don't care about it. Some people don't even think it exists. But that's the world we're in. But I'm out of here, everybody. Much love. And I will talk to you next week. Bye-bye.